today we will be dealing at some length and depth into the content of uh, Samuel Johnson's preface to Shakespeare. As you may have already known by now, Samuel Johnson's preface to Shakespeare was actually the preface of an edition of Shakespeare, which it took considerable time, energy and effort to compile. And it was ultimately published in 1765. One of the primary reasons why this preface has stood the test of time is because this preface stands out as one of the most comprehensive prose works, critical works, which deals with Shakespeare and which at the same time exposes or reveals the intellectual standards with which Shakespeare was judged and assessed in the mid 18th century. And the other reason why Samuel Johnson and many of the uh, other uh, writers, playwrights or poets of his time focused on Shakespeare was because they wanted to unravel the exact reason why Shakespeare stood the test of time. It was a wonder to most of them as to what were the ingredients of Shakespeare's works which made him stand out against so many other poets and dramatists who were writing in the uh, in the late uh, 16th and early 17th century. What was it? So essentially Shakespeare was an inspiration as well, as well as an object of emulation because most of these people that we deal with in 18th century they always had an eye on some form of an immortality in terms of uh, a name, in terms of uh, their uh, fame with regard to the works they write. And to that extent, one of the primary reasons why jo Samuel Johnson felt confident that his work on Shakespeare will stand the test of time and will in fact, uh, be read by others was because he felt he understood accurately the reasons why Shakespeare's fame has lasted so long and will perhaps last long. Right. So when we read Shakespeare's uh, the preface which Johnson has written, one of our a part of our mind will go into the fact that here is Johnson who is wanting himself to learn personally from what Shakespeare's positive sides were, what he thought Shakespeare's negative sides were, right? And when we study the preface today, we will actually deal with both these aspects of Shakespeare's, how Shakespeare was viewed or approached or read and interpreted by Samuel Johnson. Now the the primary basis of this work, as I told, is usually that of an emulation. It's, it is essentially an emulatory work in, in, the, in, in terms of the fact that here were people, Samuel Johnson was a leader among them, who was trying to unravel and emulate the reasons why Shakespeare has stood the test of time. And in fact, when Samuel Johnson finally published his edition of Shakespeare with this uh, preface in 1765. It was a culmination of decades of his engagement with Shakespeare, the earliest of which goes back to his uh, early childhood, when one of his biographers tell us that he was reading Shakespeare's his play of Shakespeare, Macbeth, which had uh, ghosts, or some form of or the supernatural elements in them and the place so much moved him that he rushed into his house to be close to his mother. So that sense of wonder that Shakespeare evoked in a child was the primary reason why the child felt that here is some power in this 
person's words which can genuinely move people in some way or the other. So that intrigue is the job is the basic seed of the lifelong intrigue that uh, Samuel Johnson had with William Shakespeare. And judged in this context, obviously, when we study this preface today, we will get into the parameters which Samuel Johnson uses while judging, say, judging Shakespeare. Now, the first thing that comes out when we read the preface is how does Samuel Johnson approach antiquity? How does Samuel Johnson approach and interpret texts which are classics which have stood the test of time? He says that some people lament that the dead are praised unreasonably. He says that the criteria of, of evaluating a writer should be uh, the excellence of his work alone and not uh, his antiquity or the history of his um, living and existence. And he was also aware of the fact that there are people who blindly advocates antiquity as the primary reason why a particular poet or a playwright or an author should be read and reread. But Samuel Johnson personally was against the use of antiquity as the only parameter of judgment in ascertaining or evaluating a classical work. So what should be the parameters or criteria of judgment according to Johnson? He says that in the field of literature, Excellence is not absolute, but excellence is gradual and it is comparative. And therefore, when a critic or a reader weighs a work of literature, the only test that can be applied aptly is the length of duration and the continuation of esteem. And these two primary criteria are the criteria where Shakespeare, according to Johnson, stood the test of time, at least in his time. Right? He says that no production of genius can be termed excellent until it has been impartially compared with other works. Right? So therefore, the primary status of a literary work is tentative at best and it is estimated only by its proportion and maybe by uh, uh, the collective approach that humanity has for that particular work. Now when he says that the works of Shakespeare have come to assume the status of a classic, I mean for his time uh, it, it, it was a uh, writer whose fame lasted more than a century and therefore was worthy of emulation in some form or the other. Now, what is the test that he wishes to impose on Shakespeare in order to understand or judge the extent of his excellence and to justify the reason why his fame has stood at least a hundred years when he was writing or maybe 150 years when he was writing. The first approach that Johnson has for Shakespeare is a plain astonishment as most of the critics of his times have. They were essentially astonished as to the reason why this person could write works with so much of prolificity and with so much of depth that his fame lasts more than a century. So what he's telling, as uh, what uh, is Johnson telling uh, in terms of why Shakespeare's fame has lasted so long? The first thing that he says is that Shakespeare's works are a just or a true representation of general nature. And since it is a true representation of general nature, there is, according to him, very little in Shakespeare, which is quote unquote unnatural. There is very little in Shakespeare which might have challenged 
the emotional or intellectual standards of the people who came to see his plays. Right? And it is for this primary reason that Johnson says that Shakespeare is immortal and his appeal is enduring primarily because his works are a just representation, a faithful representation of general nature. And remember, when Shakespeare, when Johnson says that he is faithfully portraying nature, he is not implying that faithful portrayal of nature alone can give a writer the excellence that endures. For him, this is the primary criteria of entry into the realm of excellence or enduring uh, fame. Johnson says, he elaborates on this concept in great detail as to what he means when he says that Shakespeare was true to nature. He says that Shakespeare is uh, more than any other poet or dramatist of his time, uh, a poet of nature, obviously not in the sense uh, of the nature that we usually use in when we speak of William Wordsworth, for example, or Shelley, for example. It's not nature in the sense of a physical nature. Samuel Johnson, Johnson wishes to confer very specialized meanings to the word nature when he's using it in the context of Shakespeare's plays. What is natural, therefore, to Johnson? Any and everything which the great chain of being and the cosmos expects a living being or even a non-living being at any point in time to do. That, according to Johnson, is what constitutes naturalness. Therefore, if it is a human being, the great chain of being and the human being's role in the great chain of being certainly does not warrant needless killing of fellow uh, people. The moment there is a violation on this score, we find in several Shakespeare plays as if the entire play moves from that point of violation onwards till the end towards some form of a retribution or a punishment for that violation. Look at Julius Caesar, for example. Look at Macbeth, for example. We have it in plenty and in a continuous flow in Hamlet. We have it in King Lear. The entire play as if takes place merely to correct the unnatural act that has been done earlier through someone else's unjust murder. This is what Samuel Johnson implies when he says that Shakespeare, more than any other poet, is a poet of nature. Now, when Johnson says a poor poet is true to nature, it is apparent that his works will have a wealth of instruction, wealth of wisdom, practical axioms, and even a sense that the work will teach others as to how to conduct oneself in what particular scale at what point in time. Right. So this is the primary reason why Johnson feels that Shakespeare is true to nature. And true to his own status as a critic, he always says that a a greatness or otherwise of a work has to be judged in the context of several other um, comparisons. He also does that in the preface to Shakespeare. In order to know how and why Shakespeare excels other writers in depicting the sentiments that are true to life, Johnson says that we have to compare him with other renowned authors and their poetic practices. Will a patient and a laborious perusal of his plays reveal that in Shakespeare we meet characters who, who are in a sense reflective of the natural wo human world 
that that particular character is in is in and this is best highlighted in uh, the dialogue that shakespeare uh, uses for specific characters johnson goes on to say that in shakespeare the dialogues are not accidental on in contrast it is occasioned by the incident and the character which produ produces it he says that it is so realistic and lucid that it is very difficult to believe that this uh, that a dialogue by a particular character at a particular point in time is a work of fiction in other words he feels that as if shakespeare gleans this dialogue out of common conversations that these characters might have been the other issue which endears johnson critically to shakespeare is shakespeare's treatment of love essentially when johnson is praising shakespeare's treatment of love johnson is actually praising the balance that shakespeare brought into literature as to how a poet or how a playwright or an author would treat the aspect of love this is very very significant and very few works critical works in johnson's times or even a bit later actually focused on the appropriacy with which shakespeare approached and interpreted or treated the emotion of love in his plays he says johnson says that in a majority of the dramas of other dramatists of shakespeare's time love is essentially considered as an universal agent that causes everything that is good and everything that is evil and either hastens a reaction or an action or retards an action or a reaction and this actually brings in the notion of stock characters in most most of the contemporary playwrights of shakespeare stock characters are an inevitability but the stock characters also indicate that at some point in time the playwright has lost the creative edge to bring in individuality while treating a particular character and therefore according to johnson we have stock characters in plenty in many of shakespeare's contemporaries but we have very few stock characters in shakespeare and even then the stock characters in shakespeare are not predictable by any means in other words shakespeare had injected individualism to each one of these characters so much so that no two stock characters in shakespeare can ever be the same look at clowns for example who are stock characters in most of uh, elizabethan comedies they were expected to wear specific dresses to have specific appearances to use certain uh, characteristic words and phrases while they conducted themselves but do we encounter any two clowns in shakespeare's plays who are similar no so therefore for johnson the primary reason why we are endeared to shakespeare's plays is because shakespeare's characters are not predictable characters and remember this is the primary reason why people in shakespeare's time i mean most of the people were uh, who came to see the plays of shakespeare or for that matter any other playwright were essentially people who were having a hand to mouth existence and uh, they, they had to spend a considerable fraction of their income in order to buy uh, their entry into a, an elizabethan play uh, into an elizabethan playhouse so judged in that just judged in that extent what we essentially get out of uh, shakespeare's enduring popularity in his time is the fact that people who came to see his plays would not be in a position to predict and therefore would be coming to his place in order to be surprised
right so therefore when johnson is speaking of shakespeare's treatment of love or for that matter treatment of stock characters in any way he is basically highlighting a unique trait of shakespeare's characterization and what is the trait the trait is his characters are universal and because his characters are universal they are individualized they are not characters who emulate other characters and therefore when we get hold of a speech of uh, shakespeare for example when we get it uh, well, let's say uh, macbeth i mean it's a text which you have uh, read many times like Mac Mac macbeth so how does macbeth react uh, when he fails to uh, go forward with his vision of killing duncan do we get that reaction in any other play of uh, um, uh, shakespeare or any other play of any other playwright that genuineness of uh, hesitancy mixed with a sense of horror and a very deep tension no we don't get it so essentially johnson is highlighting or underlining this uniqueness in shakespeare's methods of characterizations and therefore he says that shakespeare does not give us purely virtuous characters or purely evil characters because there is nothing such as a pure virtuality a uh, pure, pure, pure virtue uh, or a, or a, uh, utterly depraved evil continuous evil in nature we have a mix of both in most characters some features pre predominate more in one as opposed to the other and even when the plot of shakespeare's plays requires some such supernatural agency we have plenty of it in shakespeare the tone of the characters uh, the, the characters dialogues they are lifelike and realistic for example if you visualize how act 1 and act uh, act 1 scene 1 and the next scene in macbeth pans out you will understand that the reaction of macbeth and banquo to the first sight of the witches is nothing but original and genuine and none of us can actually put in or identify any reaction of either macbeth or banquo when they see the witches that is a reaction which is overwrought it is a reaction which challenges our belief no they are all, they are perfectly natural and normal reactions expected of people at that point in time when they suddenly encounter the witches right so shakespeare's expertise lies not only in portraying characters in usual situations of conversations love sorrow etc but also when these characters are encountering extraordinary situations like um, act 1 scene 2 in macbeth when they encounter the witches none of them macbeth or banquo were actually expecting to see the witches but look at how deftly or or uh, in with what naturalness shakespeare portrays their reaction therefore for samuel johnson Shakespeare's plays are not only an accurate depiction of life, but they are also accurate reflections of life. And in 18th century, in Johnson's time, accurate reflection of life was something that was hugely in demand among the aspiring poets or playwrights of the time. the reason being one can reflect on life genuinely when one has seen almost all of life either physically or through imaginative vision and it is therefore the reason why johnson feels shakespeare's plays are always informative and always instructive no matter who the reader of the audiences now in this context johnson brings in a number of other critics 
who portrayed Shakespeare or some aspects of Shakespeare's plays in a negative light. For example, uh, he speaks of Dennis and Reimer, uh, who complain that in Shakespeare's Roman plays, the Roman characters are not sufficiently Roman. The French philosopher Voltaire protests, for example, that Shakespeare's kings are not kingly in a strict sense. And in fact, uh, uh, one of uh, Shakespeare's kings in Hamlet, Claudius, is depicted as a drunkard. So these are the common allegations which Johnson puts in against Shakespeare. And he counters these allegations by defending Shakespeare from Shakespeare's perspective. How does he defend Shakespeare from the charge that his Roman characters are not essentially Roman? He understands or empathizes with the fact that for a person in the late 16th century, it might not have been possible to exactly and accurately gauge the nuance of the Romans in the history plays as they acted out to be in the first century BC or maybe first century common era. I mean, most of the plays of Shakespeare revolved around that time. So Johnson defends Shakespeare by telling that it was almost impossible for him to go back in time several, several, several centuries earlier and pick out the exact nuances of living, of talking, of conducting oneself from a civilization which, which is so very different and categorically separate from Elizabethan England that we expect that Shakespeare's Roman plays would reflect accurately the Romans of, let's say, Julius Caesar's time is a fanciful expectation. Like, so Shakespeare, Shakespeare is defended by uh, Samuel Johnson in these terms. And the other issue which uh, Johnson spent a lot of time in defending is the charge that Shakespeare very often mixed tragic and comic elements in both his tragedies and his comedies. Now, for us today, it is perhaps very easy to understand that since none of our lives are exceedingly tragic or exceedingly and continuously comic, there will be an element of both tragedy and comedy in whatever slice of life is portrayed in that stage. Therefore, Johnson is actually defending Shakespeare's um, ability to mix tragic and uh, comic emotions or actions by telling that his aim was not to write a tragedy in the Aristotelian or classical sense or not a comedy in the uh, ancient Roman sense, but essentially he was transferring a slice of life onto the stage by being true to nature. This is Johnson's view as to why Shakespeare had to mix tragic and comic elements in his plays. So why was he mixing? He was mixing because he had to. He was reflecting nature on the stage. And since most of human lives, as I told you, are, are essentially filled with uh, both negative as well as positive nuances, uh, tragic as well as comic nuances, incidents where tragic tragedy underlines comedy or incidents of where comedy underlines tragedy. In this internal and continuous mixture of emotions, tragic and comic, it will be very difficult for a playwright who is true to nature to write a continuous tragedy as an uninterrupted stream of tragic incidents and thought or a continuous comedy with an uninterrupted stream of comic strains of thoughts, right? Therefore, 
Samuel Johnson is defending a very, very seriously viewed violation among the ordinary critics of his time to Shakespeare's mixing of tragedies and comedies. Because most critics in Johnson's time were uh, taught into believing the primacy of the Aristotelian concept of tragedy, or for that matter, <clears throat> the Roman schools of comedy, the types of comedy that had to be there. For Shakespeare, the tragedy and the comedy, <coughs> sorry, they are essentially mixed attributes in a normal human life. The other thing is that, and Johnson tells it repeatedly throughout his preface, that any rigorous differentiation between tragedy and comedy can hardly exist in our lives, more so in Shakespeare's times. And therefore, Shakespeare succeeds in achieving the status of a true playwright, a playwright who is true to nature, by bringing in both tragic and comic elements into his works. Now, uh, well, we may ask whether uh, Johnson feels that it is, uh, whether Shakespeare actually knew Aristotelian dictum or prescriptions of what a tragedy should be, or someone else's <clears throat> prescriptions or dictums as to what a comedy should be or whether he was actually intellectually engaged with these classical writers and taking out strains of tragic or comic elements as they prescribed into his works. Johnson knows that Shakespeare did not. And Johnson also knows that the university wits, the, Shakespeare, the contemporaries of Shakespeare's, of, uh, 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 Shakespeare's time, they knew it and they made a deliberate attempt to emulate both tragic as well as classical comic conventions into their plays, which has brought in a sense of predictability, which has brought in a sense of <clears throat> uh, uh, a sense of essential boredom that repeated until the audience felt that their plays were not what what uh, uh, watching. And to that extent, Johnson defends Shakespeare by telling that by either deliberately or otherwise violating classical prescriptions which were restrictive to his freedom, creative freedom, Shakespeare is actually doing a service to originality and creativity. Right? So essentially, when we uh, read Johnson's uh, defense of Shakespeare, we attempt to see or we see, we detect a character who is himself, uh, uh, I mean, eroded by any standards, who read most of Shakespeare or for that matter, most of the sources which are attributed to Shakespeare, but nevertheless felt that Shakespeare was not enslaved intellectually or creatively to any other predetermined standard of literature, right? But this is not to say that Johnson was blindly emulating the virtues of Shakespeare and trying to defend Shakespeare um, against what he felt were all useless or unnecessary or unfair criticism. Johnson also pointed out what he felt were negative aspects of Shakespeare or what he felt were weaknesses of Shakespeare's plays, which he felt Shakespeare might have worked on to remove. What were the weaknesses that he detected? The first weakness that he detected was that virtue was uh, sacrificed to convenience, dramatic convenience. Very often, <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Very often, Shakespeare is more involved into pleasing than instructing. This is the first charge. 
the second charge is what he felt were some form of carelessness as it were about plot development he says that shakespeare's prose are very often uh, loosely neat and carelessly developed and in a majority of the cases he felt shakespeare would have done well to give more attention to it right so this is the second thing the third thing which johnson points out as a weakness of shakespeare is anachronism and what is that his variation of chronology or his indifference to historical accuracy in other words he brings in brings in the example of troilus and cressida he brings in the example of the use of Uh, uh, the mixture of classical legend with gothic mythology in a midsummer night's dream and so on the next charge that he brings in with regard to shakespeare is that he found certain dialogues in shakespeare especially shakespeare's comedies too coarse and indelicate especially when ladies were there in the con- in the conversation now this charge of johnson can be directly ascribed to the standards of society that he lived in in the mid 18th century and therefore we can say that this charge of samuel johnson with regard to this specific weakness of shakespeare which he says as the employment of coarse dialogues was essentially a mid 18th century attribute towards judging shakespeare's plays we are confident today that the audience of shakespeare's time did not consider the dialogues coarse right the other issue other charge that he brings in is shakespeare's undue verbosity and prolixity of words in other words what he wants to say is that shakespeare is not economical with words in other words shakespeare's speeches most of the speeches of shakespeare they are very often convoluted or the use more words than necessary and as a result many of such speeches they appear verbose now remember we cannot blame samuel johnson for bringing in this uh, from being for being bringing in this charge the primary reason being when for, well at one level obviously samuel johnson is true who could in the right frame of mind faced with the crisis that macbeth was facing in the fag end of the play embark on such a long and deep dialogue or a speech comparing human lives to candles when he feels that his death is imminent at some level johnson felt that in situations like these characters ought to be less verbose they are facing a crisis in their lives which may take their lives and therefore they do not have that freedom to indulge in deep poetry or deep philosophy but at the same time there is another issue which we need to highlight or which which we need to know and that is shakespeare's plays and much have been written about it were actually a reflection of the elizabethan concept of human life as a performance of an entire life as nothing but a performance otherwise how can we explain the fact that walter rally who was one of the most learned and prominent and once upon a time most powerful courtiers of queen elizabeth 
ultimately had to face a beheading. And before his act of beheading, he went on a speech that is still preserved today as one of the most powerful prose pieces Walter Raleigh ever wrote with deep philosophy, with uh, elaborate commentary on the state of affairs in England of that time. Now a convicted person who is about to be beheaded, how many convicted persons who is about to be beheaded, who is facing the uh, soul, would embark on that deep philosophical speech which somebody else is writing down? But we had it in Walter Raleigh. So for Shakespeare, it's not unnatural that when a character such as Macbeth is facing a crisis, a very serious crisis at that, he indulges in poetry because Shakespeare was living and working at a time when many people, not most people, many people felt the entire life was some form of a performance. So we can defend ourselves uh, today with regard to Samuel Johnson's charge of uh, this inflated vocabulary or these flamboyant speeches that Shakespeare used. Shakespeare considered that his characters, at least the characters which were close to him, were actually in a performance, as in life, as on the stage. And the other issue that, Shakespeare, that uh, Samuel Johnson focused on with regard to Shakespeare was that Shakespeare's undue craze for word play and pun. Now we all know today that among the individual writers who contributed the most to the growth of English vocabulary, we have Shakespeare right at the top. And what was difficult for Johnson to understand in his time is perhaps not so difficult for us to understand today. That somewhere or the other, Shakespeare was fighting a duel with the capacities of the language that he was born into. In other words, the primary reason why Shakespeare had to indulge in so much of word making, word play, was essentially because his creativity was fighting a duel with the limitations of Elizabethan English vocabulary. And somehow or the other, his creativity forced him to discover or invent new twists, new word phrases new clauses, new arrangements of words, importing words from other contexts and nuances. They are all meant to do justice to Shakespeare's creativity. So when we have a case where Johnson is defending Shakespeare, as well as highlighting his weaknesses, we as readers of both Shakespeare and Johnson, going on with our, with our work in the 21st century, we should be true to both Shakespeare as a product of his time and Samuel Johnson as a product of the mid 18th century. And for us today, reading the preface to Shakespeare, by Samuel Johnson is essentially two intellectual worlds separated by 150 years or so interacting with one another and putting their worlds before us for some form of judgment. Right? So this is all that I had to tell you today. Thank you.